All right. Obviously, we're <clears throat> excuse me looking at Judaism today, and um, just a reminder that that's the skeleton of the book. I actually didn't use a lot of the stuff um, from this book this time because they went a lot more into the history of the different kinds of um, way back, and I wanted to spend a little more time talking about what it looks like today. Um, but we, I did use that. And then it, there's a, a couple of websites if you wanted to do more research. Uh, obviously, there's a ton of them, but this is where I got a lot of the information about what they what. It's, it's hard to say what they believe because they're not big on beliefs, which was shocking to me. They don't really emphasize what they believe, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But they do um, cover some things, so if you're interested in further research, those are two sources. Um, <clears throat> the words Jew and Judaism actually come from the name Judah, obviously. <laughs> um, one of the 12 sons of Israel. Judah was one of the larger tribes, if you remember, that became dominant as its own country when the nation of Israel split into the two kingdoms. So the northern kingdom retained the name Israel with 10 tribes, and the southern kingdom took the name Judah with two tribes. So Judaism couldn't have come into play until after that happened. Uh, what's interesting with Jewish identity is it's not dependent on ethnicity. Um, and they, they're very bold about saying that you're not you're not uh, Jews are actually a nation comprised of multiple ethnicities there's a whole list of different ethnicities that belong to um, the Jewish nation so um, being a Jew includes characteristics either either and or ethnicity religion or peoplehood so who they relate to um, Jews and Judaism, they're kind of synonymous when you're talking about them, which I did not know. I, I thought Ju Judaism was the religion and Jews was the ethnicity, but they're actually not limited to that. They, they try, they're trying not to be known as, as, as an ethnicity. Um, they say that a person can be a Jew by birth or through religious conversion. Those are the two ways that you become Jewish. Um, thus, Judaism purports being Jew has nothing to do, now this is a shocking statement to me, but it has nothing to do with what one believes. So being Jewish is not about what they believe. It is simply a matter of birth or conversion. So for example, a person can be born to non-Jewish parents, but believe everything that an Orthodox Jew does. And if they haven't gone through the process of conversion, they're still a non-Jew. So they can go to synagogue, they can practice, they can live if exactly as a Jew, but they still would be non-Jewish if they haven't gone through the conversion process if they're born to a non-Jew. On the other hand, a person who might be born to a Jewish mother who is an atheist, and that person becomes an, is an atheist, never practicing the Jewish religion, um, they'd still be considered a Jew. So it literally, being Jewish has nothing to do with what they believe. Interesting. When one converts to Judaism, then they are every much every. They're not looked at as a Gentile or a, you know, turned Jew. Or they, they have all the rights and privileges of a Jew if you go through the conversion process. There's no different differentiation. Um, although all Jewish movements agree on the general principles of how a conversion happens, there are still within Judaism occasional disputes concerning how a person is finally converted, um, that final decision, because every branch of du Judaism, which I'll talk about shortly, um, every branch differs. And the, pro the process by which one is converted is subjective depending on what type of Jew, what branch of Judaism one belongs to. Most all branches, though, of Judaism require that conversion be done under the auspices of an Orthodox rabbi. Um, so conversion into the Jewish, 
into, it's not just Jewish religion, into Judaism or being a Jew um, requires this extensive period of time. There's no time limit. There's no beginning, no end. It's just, it's completely subjective based on what the rabbi decides with that person. So it's a study done in the Jewish community. They would like you to be part of the Jewish community if you're thinking of being converted. Um, because you have to learn all of the beliefs and practices, even though beliefs aren't important, but you have to um, convert to all of those. And, and they want Judaism to become second nature. So conversion involves living with them, eating with them, worshiping with them, doing everything. They say it's a very slow process because the rabbi needs time to assess and evaluate how the conversion is going and it doesn't end until their subjective criteria are met so depending on which branch the criteria could be completely different depending and then if you get converted into say orthodox um, Judaism you might not be accepted into the other branches of Judaism so it's kind of interesting after a rabbi decides that, yes, you can be um, converted into a Jew, then there are ritual aspects that formalize the conversion. Um, there's a, and that's all dependent on which branch you're going into as well. It could include a ritual bath, um, saying the entire liturgy in Hebrew, circumcision, if you haven't been circumcised, um, and other things. But it all varies from rabbi to rabbi. Um, they're very open to people being part of the Jewish community without converting as well, as, and we'll go into what they say happens in that situation. All right, so there's several branches of Judaism, like I said. The most common um, that most people think about when they think of Judaism is the Orthodox. This would be your traditional beliefs and practices with kosher diets, Sabbath rests, and, and the distinctive dress codes with the co head coverings and whatnot. But there's also the Reformed, or they're called Reconstructionists. These began in the 1800s. They take a more liberal viewpoint. They do away with a lot of the conservative values and practices inherent to Orthodox Judaism. You can see the relation there, even within Christianity, how that has, has changed from traditional to what we would call contemporary, perhaps. And then there's the Conservatives. That's a group that tries to balance between the two and so they'll, they'll try to keep peace with both sides um, and try to keep the doors open um, on both sides of it. When we're trying to figure out what exactly Judaism believes, it's, it's a lot more difficult than, than one would expect it to be. Um, they, they say that actions are far more important to them than beliefs. Um, they describe Judaism as a religion that's focused on the relationship between God and mankind, God and the Jewish people, the Jewish people in the land of Israel, and then relationships between human beings. So as Christianity says, they believe that everything is about relationship um, instead of what does one believe. So they say that their scripture tells the story of the development between all of these relationships and then by understanding the relationships, one can understand the mutual obligations that have to happen between those relationships. <clears throat> Unfortunately, even, well, like I said, even with Christianity, we have so many differences, right, and disagreements. It's the same with Judaism. They disagree about the nature of these obligations. Orthodox um, Judaism say they are uh, the obligations or the the rules of relationship, so to speak, are absolute, unchanging laws from God. The conservatives would say they are laws from God, but they change and evolve over time. So we have to change and evolve. Reformed say they are guidelines you can choose whether or not to follow. So it just, it's more of your choice. So every branch of, of Judaism has their own take on on how to be in a relationship with God, how to view these obligations that God has um, put out. Now, they, the, the obligations that they speak of are the 613 commandments given by God in the Torah, um, as well as the laws instituted by rabbis and customs. So it could go into the thousands if that be the case. So again, so you'd have the Orthodox saying you have to obey all of them, um, the Reformed, would say you can choose what you want to, and the conservatives say you can just, they change and evolve. So 
It's a lot of commandments, but um, <clears throat> because Judaism is more about actions and relationships than beliefs, they boast that they really don't have a formal mandatory belief system. They don't, they don't have this, that every Jew has to believe this in order to be Jewish. It's more about what you do. It's more about your actions. Um, they have accepted a summary of Jewish beliefs that consists of 13 principles. You don't have to like know all, I kept it um, short because we'll, a lot of these will be covered when we go through the core beliefs. But these principles of faith are from R Rambam, which is short for a long name of a, of a um, Jewish scholar and philosopher from the Middle Ages. And he kind of summarized um, like I said, they don't, they, don't wanna f uh, they don't want people to focus on beliefs, so they don't like us to l l give a list of what they believe because they're very open to what people believe, which is interesting. I did not know that about Judaism. I would have thought they'd be very particular. But basically, it's that God alone exists as creator. He's God. He's unique. He's in incorporeal or incorporeal which just means there's no material existence to him. He's not tangible. Um, he's incomparable, eternal. We pray to God alone to no other. The words of the prophets are true. Moses was the chief prophet, um, and Moses' prophecies are true. The Torah and the Talmud were given to Moses, divinely preserved. There will be no other Torah since it cannot be changed. Um, God knows all things, including the thoughts and deeds of men. He will reward the righteous, punish the wicked, the Messiah will come, the dead will be resurrected. Now, as we go through the actual beliefs, a lot of these aren't, these are not absolute, okay? These, when we say like the core biblical beliefs that Christianity has, those are absolute. I mean, people can have different opinions of them, but it's still, the truth is the truth. In Judaism, they're very open, like, yeah, the, they would say this is primarily what we believe and this is the basic beliefs, but if you don't agree 100%, that's okay. It doesn't change, it doesn't change who you are, okay? It doesn't change the, relig the religion. So there's a lot of, um, a lot, a lot of wiggle room in, in Judaism. Um, and even the necessity to believe these has been disputed. The liberal movement within Judaism disputes many of these principles just like the liberal movement within Christianity <laughs> disputes many of the core biblical beliefs. So it's not like, you know, that's anything new, so to speak. So the first core biblical belief is that the Bible, obviously, in Christianity, is an errant, infallible, authoritative, and sufficient for every situation. The, um, in Judaism, there's two holy books. There's the Torah, which really is just the Old Testament. That it, they call it the Torah, but it is the Old Testament exactly as we have it, except that they have, uh, we have 39 books and they have 24. They didn't split Kings, they didn't split Chronicles, they didn't split Samuel. They put Ezra and Nehemiah together and they just put all the, the 12 minor prophets into one book. So the same content of the Old Testament, um, just how they arrange it is, is a little, well, not it, how they arrange it, but how they combine it. And then they have the Talmud. Um, their main one, or their big one, is, is the Babylonian Talmud. It's a collection of legal and ethical writings that include Jewish history and folklore. It serves primarily as a guide to the civil and religious laws um, of Judaism. So Orthodox uh, Jews believed the laws in the Talmud were given to Moses from God. So it's all of those commandments that we talked or that I mentioned. Um, that these, though, were commandments that were passed down orally from generation to generation. So they're not necessarily just the ones that are in the Torah. Uh, yeah, in the Torah. They could be in the Talmud without being in the Torah. So if Moses gave, whatever is in the Talmud is the additional um, stuff. So it's raised to the same level of authority as Scripture, as, as the Torah. Then they say around 8,200 scholars wrote down these oral laws. So oral laws were given from God to Moses. Then around two, the year 200, um, they, the oral laws were um, written down. And those are called the Mishnah. 
um, later, scholars explained and interpreted the Mishnah. So God spoke, and he spoke, and he spoke from generation to generation. Then it was written down, and then they needed an explanation about what was written down. Um, and those comments were recorded in the Gemara um, sometime later, within the next 300 years. And so it's the Mishnah and the Gemara that make up the Talmud. So if you were to try to remember the Torah would be the written word and the Talmud would be the written oral word and, and its interpretation. It'd be like our commentaries, um, but our commentaries we don't raise to the same level of, of expertise or as authority as we do the Bible, right? Okay, so, but they do that with the Talmud. Um, there's a less authoritative Talmud called the Jerusalem Talmud or the Talmud of the land of Israel. It also contains parts of the Mishnah and Gemara, but it's shorter overall. And um, if you were to study both of them, there's inconsistencies between the two, which leads to questions as to why the Talmud is elevated to such a position of authority since there's, there's inconsistencies. But nonetheless, that's what they, what they use. The second core belief is that God is one God, three persons with innumerable attributes. In Judaism, God alone exists and is creator. God is one and unique. God is non-material and incomparable. However, that God is not the triune God. Um, they do not believe in Jesus and they do not believe in the Holy Spirit. Okay, so... Um, so their God is the father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but not Jesus. Um, in their, um, in Judaism, God is neutral in gender, omnipresent, omnipotent, omniscient, just, merciful, holy, perfect. He is our father and our king. Um, they maintain that we are all God's children, and one of the greatest gifts to hum humanity is knowing that, that God has made it known to us that, he, that we are his children. So it all sounds pretty good until, unless you know that they don't believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Names are super important to them. Um, they treat names with great respect. And so if you've ever read anything by Jewish people, they leave, usually they leave the vowels out. So they would go G dash D. Um, because they don't use his whole name. The reason is um, they, they don't want you to accidentally disrespect the name. So if you were to write out uh, God, uh, God on a piece of paper and then crinkle it up and throw it away, that shows great disrespect to God. And so um, they would never, they never do that. I was reading a, a lot more about what they, what they do with technology now because obviously you could write it out and they say that doesn't backspacing or deleting doesn't dishonor him because it's not a physical destruction so you can do that but even if you were to, if you go to those websites you'll see that they don't print out God's name or they do G D um, when they do uh, because they say there's the possibility that people print out their material and then if you were to be careless after you printed it out that would show disrespect to God, so that that's the big reason why they do that. the The most important name in Judaism is this for they call it the four letter, the four letter name. Um, they said a lot of people say that it's like just shortened and it means Jehovah or Yehovah, but they are very they go through a really long explanation about why that's not true, and I, I didn't take the time to explain that to you today, but that is the most holy. Um, they say nobody knows how to pronounce it, um, and and it's just it's the name of God though, and it's super important. You know, the, they say the name is so important because it conveys the nature, the history, the essence, and the reputation of a person. So, um, and really, we should feel the same way. I mean, God's name is all of that and more, right? So, we we likewise should treat His name um, very um, holy. The, in Judaism, then, a name is to be treated with the same respect as a person's reputation. So they're very careful um, in how they re, re, um, reflect the name of God. 
<clears throat> the next core belief is that man is created in God's image. They too believe that humanity was created in the image of the creator. Um, obviously with the, the ability to discern and reason, but there's no other similarities that we would have with God. They believe humanity has an inclination to both good and evil, and free will is the ability to choose which one to follow. Um, but remember, there's no Holy Spirit in us to lead us, so free will is still looked at a little differently than what we look at it in Christianity. They also describe their beliefs about human nature to be abstract, um, with a lot of room for personal opinion. So basically, they say that the Jewish people can believe what they want about human nature. It's not important. Again, that's reiterated throughout their belief system. That's not a belief system. <laughs> Um, that beliefs are not as important as our actions. Which is interesting because there's uh, actions that you do that if you don't do them, you're really disrespectful. But you, you kind of got to under, everything for them is, is about what you, your actions, not about what you believe. So beliefs, belief systems are just very open with them. Um, they say that there is no absolute dogma on the subject of human nature and, and all that's required or all that's involved with that. They say that, in fact, they, they are, um, there are a variety of contrary opinions expressed on the matter in Judaism. And so if you were to go to, to the Orthodox or to the Reform, you might hear something completely different about human nature and they are, it doesn't make you, they're very clear that it doesn't make you less of a Jew if you believe something different. So they, they're very open-minded when it comes to their belief system, um, especially in, and we'll see that again when we get to talking about heaven. They're very, people can believe basically whatever you want in Judaism um, because it's not about your belief, it's about who you are and what you, or what you, your actions in life. Um, they, we in Christianity believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, his work for and in us. Um, they, Jews, believe that Jesus did not fulfill the messianic prophecies, which established the criteria for the coming of the Messiah. So, and I meant to have a list for you. I have, a, uh, I have one list. There's many more, but I have a list of 20 messianic prophecies in the Old Testament that were fulfilled in the New that they totally reject, that say that he did not fulfill, uh, establish the criteria. Um, authoritative texts in Judaism reject Jesus as God. They reject him as divine. They reject him as the intermediary between humans and God. They reject him as Messiah, as saint, or anything else for that matter. They, he, he is um, irrelevant is, is how they put him in on their web if you were to read anything on their websites Jesus is irrelevant to them um, in some of them the stronger ones they say he's the biggest stumbling block of all um, I was reading um, there's a Judaism 101 website it's really nice because they give you levels so basic intermediate <laughs> and difficult so it helps you understand if you you know, what reading level you're at and to understand what they're um, talking about. And um, I typed in Jesus because I was like, well, what do you believe about Jesus? And it came up looking for Jesus. You won't find him here. This is a site about Judaism and Jews don't believe in Jesus. Jesus is simply not a part of Judaism. He is irrelevant to our religion. To ask a Jew, why don't you believe in Jesus, is like asking a Christian, why don't you believe in Zeus? We don't teach anything about Jesus because he's not part of our religion. In your religious institutions, you study your own religion. You don't study every other religion in the world and explain why they're wrong, unless you're at LCM. <laughs> no, I'm not explaining why they're wrong. I'm just helping us understand so that we can do a better job about being who we are. He said, we do this, he or she said, we do the same. We don't study why we don't believe in Jesus because he's simply not a part of our religion. When we discuss Jesus, it's usually in response to attempts to convert Jews, which are more common and more aggressive than most non-Jews realize. They are very, very opposed 
to conversion attempts by Christians. And so just know that right from the start. They, they um, don't appreciate our attempts to introduce them to Jesus. They went on to explain, however, so after they wrote all of that, then they went on to explain why they don't believe in Jesus. <laughs> So I was like, well, you just said you weren't going to talk about Jesus, and now you're going to talk about him. And they did a rather thorough job of explaining why they don't, and I won't go into all of that. But they said the basic reason they don't believe is because they don't believe in the Christian New Testament. So it's not part of their Bible, and the Bible is not one book but a collection of books. And then they went on to say Jews, Catholics, Protestants, Mormons each have their own idea of what books belong in their collection. We wouldn't accept another religion's idea of what belongs in our Bible, so don't expect Jews to accept your idea of what belongs in our Bible. So they're very just clear cut. You know, this is who we are. You don't have to like it, but we're not going to change just because, and we're not going to probably give you answers that you're going to like. Um, so Jews uh, <coughs> say that they had a clearly formed idea of the Messiah in the Messianic age, long before Jesus came along, and Jesus just didn't live up to it. Um, Jews expected the restoration of the Davidic monarchy and a just and peaceful society throughout the world as foretold by the prophets during the age of the Babylonian exile. The Jews of the Roman Empire desperately longed for, what beautiful, for that beautiful ideal as they suffered under Roman tyranny. They weren't looking for an incarnated God who would die and absolve them of their sins. Sin and salvation are not at the core of Judaism. So they're not looking, his, their point is they're not looking for a savior. They're not looking for, and, and that would be very clear, even the return of the Messiah is not, they're not looking for him to be their savior. And, and I think that's a really, a, a key component to understanding Judaism. Even when they talk about the Messiah returning, and we'll get to that at the very end, it's not to come as a savior to atone for sins. That's not at the core of Judaism. The way, um, they're, they're very interested in the here and now. That's, that's their emphasis. Um, and so they say they weren't looking for this God who would die and absolve them of sins, um, the way many branches of Christianity express it. Jews don't believe Jesus is the Messiah because he never did any of the things they expect the Messiah to do, um, the things that the prophets proclaimed the Messiah would do. So he basically hasn't lived up to their expectations, and thus Jesus is, is nothing. Um, they, they say that Christianity gets around this fact that you know, we say Jesus has done it all and he's coming back to do it, to finish it. Um, he said, from a Jewish perspective, the Messiah is identified by his tangible acts. Any promises to finish the job in the future are not going to convince the Jewish people. So to tell them, you know, that Jesus is coming back to fulfill that means they'll they, that means nothing to them because in their world, the Messiah is going to come tangibly, not as a God, not as an, not, he's coming as a person to make all things right. So they're not looking for a God. They're not looking for a God. I, mean, I guess that's the easiest way to say it. They're not looking for a savior. They're looking for a man who will come and set all things right. Make sense? All right, um, a core belief of Christianity is that Jesus continues to work through the Holy Spirit. Um, obviously, the Holy Spirit's not God in, in Judaism, um, so the Spirit of God would be simply, it's really, you won't find hardly anything written about it, but if you do find something in Judaism, it's just divine inspiration. Holy Spirit is not talked about at all. Um, all right. In biblical Christianity, we believe the people of God are the church. Um, they, of course, don't believe in the New Testament, so church is a building. It's not the people. Um, and they call, a Jewish church is called a synagogue or a temple, and it is a place 
for worship and study. It also serves as their town hall or their social center. Basically, everything happens in the synagogue or the temple. Um, Jewish churches are run by lay people, uh, financed by membership dues. No collection plates are ever passed because Jewish law prohibits carrying money on most of the days that they meet together. So they, they pay membership dues annually. Um, there's also opportunities like voluntary donations. They purchase reserved seats for their big holidays, Hosh, uh, Rosh Hashanah, um, and those kind of, I think that's how you say it. <laughs> they, they have their, um, so you can purchase seats to, because those are so highly attended. Uh, they also do memorial plaques, so they raise a lot of money. Money is not an issue uh, in the Jewish church or in Judaism. The synagogues are generally designed. I meant to have some pictures, but I ran out of time. The synagogues are generally designed so the front faces Jerusalem, the direction there to face when reciting prayers. Uh, there are several ritual, ritual items found in synagogues. They, uh, they have the ark that holds the Torah scrolls in the front of the room, always on the side closest to Jerusalem. Uh, there's a curtain to imitate the temple curtain. It's open and closed by members of the congregation when there's certain prayers done during the service. And it's a great honor if you are the ones that get to open and close the curtains. Everyone stands when the ark is open. There's eternal lamp above the ark. We have an everlasting light in, our, in most Christian churches to represent the continual light burning, um, just a different meaning. <laughs> and there is a menorah. Uh, generally and it's interesting because depending on where it's at in the temple or the synagogue they can't replicate anything so like the menorah has seven candles and you can have that and I'm, I'm not don't quote me on this because I'm not positive but it's either in the synagogue or the temple and then in the other place you have to have six or eight because you can't they have a thing with replication so you have to be careful with that um, and then they generally have something like this where the Torah scrolls are placed to read from. So pretty um, Old Testament, you'll see, you could probably look at an Old Testament temple and understand what, uh, what a synagogue would look like. In Orthodox synagogues to this day, there's a separate section for women to sit. They either have to sit in the upper floor balcony, back of the room, or a side, on the side separated from the men's section by either a wall or a curtain still in Orthodox churches uh, or yeah, synagogues. Men are not permitted to pray in the presence of women because they're supposed to have their minds on prayers, not on pretty girls is the, what the one thing said. So they're very, um, and that's just in the Orthodox um, branch. Non-Jews can visit synagogues, but you are required to dress and behave appropriately. Dress, and they say dress like you're going to church and you probably don't want to say that to Christians anymore. <laughs> anymore. Oh, suit and tie. Yes, suit and tie. They, they do say to dress formal um, and modestly. A man should wear a skull cap if Jewish men in the congregation do. So you And you know that by they'll have them at the door. So if you were to show up at a Jewish, Jewish synagogue and didn't have it on, um, you would know if you had to have one on because they'd have a basket of them for you. And in synagogues, married women in the Orthodox generally also wear a head covering, and it's just a piece of lace that they also provide at the door for non-Jews to so that you can still come in and worship. They say that non-Jews should not wear a prayer shawl to a synagogue. And I don't know if anybody knows, but especially in the non-denominational non churches, prayer shawls are a big deal. You know, but they, if you go to a, if you're a non-Jew going to a Jewish synagogue, they don't want you, they won't let you wear a prayer shawl in because um, that's a sign of their obligation to honor Jewish law and non-Jews can't do that. Interesting things that I just thought you'd want to know in case you have Jewish friends and you go to a Jewish synagogue, you want to know how to respect where they're at. Proselytizing and witnessing to the congregation is not proper guest behavior. And they're very, so this must happen a lot because they're very pointed about telling us not to do it. And they say, you don't walk into a stranger's house and criticize their decor. Don't come into our house and try to change us. They said, non-Jews are welcome if you come out of genuine curiosity 
if you're interested in the service or you simply want to join a Jewish friend in celebrating. Non-Jews are, are, are encouraged to follow along as much as they like. They, they do do their services in Hebrew, but English is right alongside of it. They said they don't really care how much or how little you participate. Um, however, they say when the ark is open, everyone in the house has to stand, no matter if you're Jewish or non-Jewish. The rest of the time, they don't care what non-Jews do. They said you can just sit there as long as you're not proselytizing, witnessing, or making a commotion. They do consider a synagogue a house of prayer, but they, um, as Christians, say you could pray anywhere. Um, they can satisfy their obligations to prayer anywhere. They are very clear, though, there are certain prayers that can only be said in the presence of a minion, which is a quorum of 10 adult men. So they do believe uh, their tradition teaches there's more merit to praying in a group than, in alo than alone. Um, interesting, you know, in, in the New Testament, we're told that where two or three are gathered in his name. Well, they wouldn't say that, of course, because it's, but they do believe that there's more power with more people praying. Uh, Jewish clergy are employees of the synagogue, uh, hired and fired by the lay members of the synagogue. They are definitely, which I did not know, um, they're not appointed, like in the Catholic churches, um, priests are appointed, but in, in um, Jewish then they're not called, they are hired. Uh, and if an Orthodox synagogue would hire a Reformed rabbi, they lose membership in the Orthodox Union. So they're, they, if they want to maintain a membership in whichever branch of Judaism they are, they have to get rabbis that are in that belief system, otherwise you're automatically out of that one. And um, they said that there's often a lot of tension between the rabbis and the membership. Um, it can, and they said it can, it can be by serving pepperoni pizza. Um, they, they said that the one, and it's, it was a Jewish website. They said there's often rabbis have been fired for letting pizza be served or pepperoni pizza be served when they didn't think they should. So that all the power lies with the people in the Jewish. Um, synagogue, and if they disagree with the rabbi, they just let him, let him go. At the same time, they'll say they have some respect for the rabbis, um, but the rabbi is definitely um, hired there. Uh, our last core belief is that Christ will bring his king, his kingdom in glory. Um, not, obviously, Jesus is not coming in Judaism, so he won't be coming in glory. They do pray for the return of the Messiah every day, however. Um, they call this the Mashiach. And the Mashiach is not even um, mentioned, they say it's not even mentioned explicitly in the Torah. And so they say that the Mashiach is a very abstract concept in Judaism. No less respected, but it's an abstract concept. They say the term means uh, anointed one. And the Mashiach will come as king at the end of days. Again, it doesn't mean savior. Messiah doesn't mean savior in their religion. Uh, they say the notion of an innocent divine being who sacrifices himself to save us from the consequences of our own sin is purely cr Christian with no basis in Jewish thought. So no need, no need for a savior. The Mashiach, they say, will be a great political leader descended from King David, uh, well-versed in Jewish law, will observe all of the commandments, will be a charismatic leader, inspiring to follow a great military leader and judge, will win many battles for Israel, and will make righteous decisions. He is a human being, not a god or a supernatural being. He will come when he's most needed. So they, they are looking for his return, and um, apparently it's not yet. Um, he's a, uh, there will be war, and the Mashiach will bring political and spiritual redemption of the Jewish people at that point, bringing them back to Israel and restoring Jerusalem. He will establish a government in Israel that will be the center of all world government for both Jews and non-Jews. He will rebuild the temple, reestablish worship, restore the religious court system of Israel, establish Jewish law as the law of the land. The Messiah will usher in the Messianic age, which is simply peaceful 
coexistence of all people, the whole lion and the lamb laying down together, all of that. The whole world, at that point, they say, will recognize the Jewish God as the only true God and the Jewish religion as the only true religion. They say there will be no sin during this time. Sacrifices will still be made, but they would just be Thanksgiving offerings at that point. And then they said that everything will be so simple and obvious, all theological truths, there won't be any reason to have these kind of discussions anymore because they said it'll be as obvious as two plus two equals four, that, that they had it right. Um, traditional Judaism firmly believes death is not the end of human existence. However, because Judaism is primarily focused on life here now, not the afterlife, they don't have any absolute beliefs on what happens at the, at, at the end end. Um, they, just like they don't have any absolute beliefs on human nature, they don't have absolute dogma on afterlife. They call it ol Olam Haba, I'm probably mispronouncing that, so if any Jewish people are watching, I'm sorry. Um, but it means the world to come. Uh, they leave room then for the afterlife to personal opinion. They said that Jews can believe the souls of the righteous dead go to a place similar to the Christian heaven or they can believe that they're reincarnated for many lifetimes. They're okay with however you want to view afterlife. Um, they said uh, some, peop some Jewish people simply b will wait until the coming of the Messiah. So it, it varies. They said there's this whole, and it doesn't make you less of a Jew if you believe this or if you believe that. Um, they can believe the souls of the wicked are tormented by demons of their own creation, or they can believe that the wicked just cease to exist after death. They, they just, if you were to type in the afterlife, you're not going to find a whole ton of information um, because that's not their focus. And um, they just believe that everything will turn out okay. And they believe they're the chosen ones, so all the more it's going to be good for them. I want to end with a, um, a testimony from a, a Jewish Christian. I didn't know, I mean, I guess we would call them a Messianic Jew then. Um, and this is, this is what he wrote. I, there's a website that uh, for all those who have come out of, of Judaism, actually, um, and I, the, the, I could have chosen from a bunch, but this one struck me as uh, really powerful. He said he, when he was eight years old, he was given the Hebrew name uh, Shimon Yehoshua HaLevi. I'm assuming he went by the name Levi then. I was born a Levite into a very Orthodox Jewish family exposed to the traditions of Judaism from a young age. I remember lo so looking forward to the festivals at a, as it always represented a time of fun and family, a time where we celebrated the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. For most of my childhood, I attended a Jewish private school. I did not have any non-Jewish friends. It sounds like a Christian story, doesn't it, <laughs> for some of us? The only knowledge of non-Jews I had was from my mother's side of the family as she was a convert to Jew Judaism. I grew up believing the way to God was through his 613 laws, and the more I could manage to keep, the closer I would get to God. Partly due to my zealousness to becoming a real mensch, which is a person of honor in the Jewish community, I received a bursary, which is a scholarship. I had to look all these words up because I didn't know what they were. To study at a yeshiva, which is a, a Jewish institution in Israel, and learn with esteemed religious scholars about Orthodox Judaism, its laws and traditions. During my absence, my family had become connected with an ultra-Orthodox Jewish organization called Chabad. So when I returned, I also became very involved with this movement. I did my utmost best to live according to Jewish law and the Chabad customs. Around the age of 19, I began to feel empty inside. The works I was doing to try and gain a relationship with God were not achieving the results I wanted. I had become lost in my Jewish walk, which was a habitual relationship with God rather than a heartfelt spiritual personal relationship going through the motions. Again, you could easily put Christian in here, I believe, for some of us. I stopped attending synagogue. I gradually began turning my back on the God I had become so zealous to serve. The thought of Judaism with all of its rules and traditions seemed so boring and shallow compared to what the world had to offer. 
My downward spiral into the world had begun. I ditched university for a job that allowed me to move out of my parents' house. I thought independence would free me from all obligations. I experimented with drugs and alcohol, was busy being devious and calculating in business, eventually hardly acknowledging God in my life at all. I became a man living only for myself. During my time in the world, I had one or two friends throw the name of Jesus around. I was even told how through my unbelief, I would have no place in heaven. My pure Jewish pride would send people away in disbelief. I always felt if you were lucky enough to be born Jewish, you were the only, you were the only religion entitled to a relationship with God. And I felt I would always be chosen and looked after no matter what I did. In 2010, I met Kara. I fell in love instantly, and I knew this girl would have a permanent impact on my life. I never once thought her faith in Christianity would ever get in the way. If we were to marry, she would obviously convert to Judaism. After all, who wouldn't want to be part of the chosen gener uh, nation? Her father was a born-again Christian and did not take lightly to the fact that we were dating. He began witnessing to me about his Messiah. I never took this lightly, and many tears were shed as we found it difficult to cope with the pressure. Kara's mother gave me a Bible at that time, but I never opened it. I stored it away in my cupboard. I was extremely unhappy inside at that time, and my life seemed to be emptying more and more. I fought the concept of Jesus like a flu that didn't want to go away. Everything inside me wanted to remain faithful to my Orthodox Jewish upbringing and not bring shame to my family. One night while lying on my bed, I began talking to God. Are you indeed real? Do you still remember me? I asked him if he had a son. If so, was it Yeshua? Is the Holy Spirit real? I then heard a small, still voice speak to me. <laughs> I, I always think um, that's the difference with Christianity. We have God. We have Holy Spirit. If we just let him, he's the only one that's alive and will speak to people if we just step out. But anyways, he said, Holy Spirit said, there's a Bible in your cupboard. Open it up. I picked up the Bible, and, I, and the page it opened was Matthew chapter 1. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, son of David, son of Abraham. It took me a couple months to come to terms with this new concept. <laughs> I've been taught the only relationship you can have with God is through a law instituted by Moses. I then sought to find proof in the Old Testament that Jesus was indeed real. After all, as a Jew, we are always encouraged to find physical proofs for everything. I managed to find so many prophecies about Jesus. I found scriptures that affirm over and over that Jesus Christ of Nazareth was the Messiah sent to earth by God to save all people from their sin. I couldn't get around it. His sacrifice opened the way to the Father, and that is why I now have a real personal relationship with him. He has not only canceled my debt, but also released me from my addiction. I've learned how to love and to receive love. I have no problem controlling what used to be a mighty temper. I don't swear anymore. I have no desire to. I read the Bible with a new understanding, but most importantly is that I have a real relationship with God. God has set me a very special task of telling my testimony to Jewish people all over the world. God has equipped me through his Holy Spirit to teach the children of Israel all about Jesus so they can receive his salvation. 